ancient Egypt. For millennia, it has captured the imaginations, hearts and minds of generations of truth seekers, eager to know who really built the pyramids, when they were built, and why they were built. This documentary series is comprehensive. It's the biggest documentary series ever made about ancient Egypt. This documentary series will not only rewrite the history of ancient Egypt, it will turn the history of the human race upside down. So come with me as we go down the Nile and we discover the truth beneath the sands of Egypt. I was a child, I had a fascination with ancient Egypt. Any book, any documentary, I watched it, I read everything. But every time I saw it or I read it, something about what the Egyptologists were telling me didn't ring true. And for years and years and years, like a big jigsaw puzzle, I tried to put the pieces together. And I tried to put them together the way the Egyptologists had them. But the picture didn't make sense. And then I came to Egypt and I saw the evidence for myself. And the picture started to take a different shape. So come with me as we go down the Nile and we discover the truth beneath the sands of Egypt. The earliest evidence of human habitation in ancient Egypt is believed by some to go back as far as 600,000 years, probably more, well into the Paleolithic era or the Stone Age, an era defined by the appearance and development of the earliest cultures to use stone tools. But it was not until the 4th millennium BC, around 3100 BC, and the dynasties of pharaohs as we know them today, that mortal humans came to the throne of Egypt. That's over half a million years that humans were supposedly on the planet before they ruled in 3100 BC. So what happened before then, before 31,000 BC? Prior to this, the collective sum of recorded history of ancient Egypt, including the creation myth, was found recorded in wall decorations and writings in several Egyptian monuments known as the pyramid texts. Now, according to the pyramid texts, which are the sum of all the wall decorations and writings found in and on several ancient Egyptian temples and monuments, they contain most of the recorded history and creation myths of ancient Egypt, including a period that emerged from the primordial chaos called the Zeptepi, when gods ruled the earth. These texts include the Turin Papyrus, the Palermo Stone, the Shakaba text, the Edfo Building text, and the Abydos King List at the Temple of Seti I. And that sounds like a good place to start. The Palermo Stone records the reign of the last 120 kings who ruled Egypt before mortals began their rule in Egypt with the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt in 3100 BC. It includes 10 Thinite kings who ruled for 350 years, before them 30 Memphite kings who reigned for 1790 years, and preceding them another line of kings that held sway for 1817 years. But who or what were these Thinite or Memphite kings? And what was the difference between them? And if they weren't mortal men, what were they? Neanderthals? Demigods? Hybrid offspring of the gods and humans? All we can assume is that they weren't fully human. So what were they? Were they 100% alien? 
or were they some sort of hybrid alien-human species? The list on the Palermo stone is supported by the Abydos King list at the Temple of Seti I, which not only contains the names of all the Thinite and Memphite kings, but on the opposite wall, a list of all the gods who ruled in Egypt, going back to the remote Zeptepi, or first time. A time when primordial gods supposedly reigned over Egypt for 20,000 years. However, for scholars, one of the most interesting documents is the Papyrus of Turin, or commonly referred to as the Papyrus of Kings, a document dating from the 19th dynasty of Egypt that shows, in addition to the king's list following the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, a list of divine and semi-divine kings who ruled Egypt's pre-dynastic period. Researchers believe that by calculating the decrypted information of the Turin Papyrus, we obtained the initial period referred to as the Kingdom of Ptah, creator and first ruler of ancient Egypt, dating back 39,000 years. This list includes a dynastic lineage of semi-divine beings or demigods called the Followers of Horus, who arrived sometime around 8,355 BC and reigned for 1,255 years. Were the Memphite and Thinite kings some sort of descendants of these demigods? Were they hybrid offspring of the Followers of Horus? It's possible. And is there any significance to the date of the arrival of these semi-divine beings on or around 8,355 BC? We'll have to wait and see. Preceding the followers of Horus, there supposedly ruled the spirits of the dead for 5,813 years. How interesting. The spirits of the dead. Now, we can not only speculate as to who the spirits of the dead were, but who the dead were, and therefore who the living were, and how long they lived, and what it was that killed them, and why they stayed spirits for so long. Prior to the rule of the spirits of the dead was a time referred to as the Zeptepi, or first time, a remote epoch prior to ancient Egypt, when the waters of the abyss receded and the primordial darkness was banished. When the waters of the abyss receded. If an abyss is a deep, immeasurable gulf or vast chasm, how can waters of an abyss recede? Where would they go? Surely the correct interpretation here is when the waters from the abyss receded, meaning waters from the deepest oceans flooded the land, massive tidal waves or tsunamis, and the primordial darkness was banished. Is that some reference to the ending of something that was obscuring the sun? A reference to an eclipse of some sort? And if it wasn't the moon making the eclipse, what was it? And is this all some reference to a time after the Great Flood mentioned in the Bible? Or perhaps there was more than one Great Flood? And could one of these floods be what caused all the damage to the Nubian temples on the shores of modern-day Lake Nassar that we explored in previous episodes? At this stage, the possibility can't be excluded. So let's look a little deeper. At the time of the Zeptepi, around 34,000 BC, almighty gods from the skies, perhaps even aliens, descended from the stars to the earth on flying boats and turned mud and water into a new kingdom. These gods, including Ra, Ptah, Thoth, Osiris, Isis, Set and others, ruled on earth in Egypt for 20,000 years, with the kingship passed from one to the other in an unbroken succession, the last of the gods to rule being Horus, the son of Isis. More on that in a later episode. 
Researchers believe that by calculating the decrypted information obtained from the papyrus of Turin, we obtain the initial period referred to as the Kingdom of Ta, creator and first ruler of ancient Egypt, dating back 39,000 years. So it seems, according to the ancient Egyptian records, that something quite profound happened between 37,000 and 34,000 BC. Something that defined the future of not only ancient Egypt, but of the whole history of the human race. The issue of the Zep Tepi has created confusion amongst many researchers and has affected our comprehension of the true prehistory of ancient Egypt. Unfortunately, most academic Egyptologists collectively agree to confine the Zep Tepi to mythology, that it either didn't happen or that it somehow didn't happen the way it is described. And despite the evidence, and despite plain logic, they continue misattributing many of the archaeological finds, such as the Osirian at Abydos, the pyramids themselves, and the Sphinx, attributing them to the dynastic Egyptians. Why? I mean, the only reason I can think of is that the Zep Tepi can't possibly exist because it contradicts their mainstream beliefs especially those directly related to religious dogma. But what if everything documented by the ancient Egyptians is true? I mean, they had no reason to lie as far as I know. So, what do we do? Do we believe that all these documented references to pre-dynastic rulers are not based on ancient tradition and memories, not based on fact, but a mere invention? Or do we take the position that there is some, if not all, truth in them. To do that, we need to look much deeper into the evidence, much further back into history, and see what that tells us. The earliest evidence of human habitation in ancient Egypt is believed to go back as far as 600,000 years, well into the Paleolithic era, lasting from around 2.6 million BC to around 8,500 BC, the Paleolithic era is divided into three periods. The Paleolithic, the oldest Stone Age, the Mesolithic, or Middle Stone Age, and the Neolithic, or the New Stone Age. Of course, these dates and periods are not arbitrary. They should not be understood as any kind of demarcation ending one era and beginning another. Any and all dates should be understood to be approximations. And the further back in time one travels in ancient Egypt, the more room there is for variation. During the Stone Age, humans shared the planet with a number of now extinct hominin relatives, including Neanderthals from 450,000 to 40,000 BC, and Denisovans. Whilst Neanderthals are known from numerous fossils, until recently everything scientists had learned about Denisovans came from a handful of teeth and bone fragments discovered in the Denisova cave in Russia's Altai Mountains. DNA from these remains revealed that the Denisovans were a sister group to Neanderthals, both descending from a population that split away from modern humans about 550 to 765,000 years ago. Now, it's important to know that that's not actually a fact. Yes, Denisovans were a sister group to Neanderthals, but to say they split from modern humans and did so over half a million years ago, well, that's a speculation based on Darwin's theories of natural selection and the associated theory of evolution, both of which have more holes in them than Swiss cheese, which we'll get to in a later episode. The actual evidence about human evolution shows a very different scenario, which we will get to in due course in a later episode. For now, let's focus on the evidence. It was also at Denisova Cave that a bone fragment was recently discovered that belonged to an ancient human hybrid individual who had a Denisovan father and a Neanderthal mother, indicating that the two groups seem to have met and interbred. The questions are, was that crossbreeding natural or artificially instigated, as in genetically engineered? 
And when did it actually take place? A comparison with the genome of the Neanderthals from the Denisova cave not only revealed local interbreeding, but also evidence of interbreeding with an as yet unidentified ancient human lineage. Now that's interesting, because surely that would propose a breeding population of this unknown and unidentified lineage. So where are all the fossils? Unless there are no fossils, because the unidentified lineage is not from this planet, or the DNA was introduced through genetic engineering. So does the DNA belong to, or was it supplied by, the gods who came to this planet? It's certainly something worth considering. During the Mesolithic era, there were numerous important geographic and climactic changes that affected human societies, including the end of the prolonged downpours of the Abbasia Pluvial around 120,000 to 90,000 BC, after which the Sahara returned to a desert state. Homo erectus had evolved into Homo neanderthalensis and began to escape the encroaching desert by migrating to the Nile Valley and to the oases that were left, such as the one at Kaga. Kaga, which is so far inland, was it really an oasis? Or was it part of an old western branch of the Nile? The oldest evidence of man-made structures discovered thus far in this region were those found in the region of Wadi Halfa, ancient Nubia in modern-day Sudan. The Wadi Halfa communities were built by a hunter-gatherer society who constructed homes of flat sandstone floors, most likely covered by animal skins or brush, and possibly held up by wooden stakes. Logical guesses! But of course, the actual structures disappeared centuries ago. Although somehow, the man-made depressions in the earth with stone floors remained. These depressions were discovered by the Polish archaeologist Waldemar Kimlewski in the 1980s and were designated tentrings in that they provided an area to set up a shelter that could easily be taken down and moved similar to what we might find in a modern campsite. Kmielewski dated these rings to the late Paleolithic age of approximately 100,000 BC. 100,000 BC? Why not 200,000 or 300,000? And how did Kmielewski date these rings? It's got me beat as to how they even survived, let alone how you can date a flat sandstone floor or a stone circle for that matter. How can you date them to any time? Carbon dating certainly doesn't work. But these so-called experts seem to be able to date inorganic matter at will. The development of new stone industries and survival techniques coupled with the Mysterian Pluvial between 50,000 and 30,000 BC, which was even greater than the Abbasian that preceded it, caused a widespread distribution of early human culture. Important geographic and climatic changes that affect human societies, incessant rains ceasing and deserts appearing, that sounds like a pole shift to me. In fact, several pole shifts. Surely that would include changes like great floods and geological upheavals that changed the course of rivers. Is it too much of a stretch to align Kmeblevsky's rings with the late Mesolithic period and the Great Flood around 34,000 BC? Meaning, were the rings there before the Great Flood and somehow survived, although the animal skin walls were swept away? Or did the rings originate after the Great Flood because they had to start rebuilding civilization all over again, starting at the most basic of levels? And was this when the gods arrived, or possibly returned, the time of the Zep Tepi? The ancient Egyptian creation myths are the ancient Egyptian accounts of the creation of the world. 
In all of these myths, in a distant period known as the Zeptepi, sometimes transcribed as the first occasion or the first time, the world was said to have emerged from an infinite lifeless sea, a time when the sun rose for the first time. I think it's important we make a delineation here that perhaps the modern Egyptologists are not making or acknowledging. The difference between the creation of the world, as we know it, and the difference between the creation of the universe, or what scientists might call the Big Bang, as opposed to the creation of man and life on Earth. I think in many cases, the ancient Egyptians are referring to either one or the other but that over thousands and thousands of years, the lines have been blurred somewhat and or totally misread and misinterpreted by the modern Egyptologists. You see, when you study the mythologies of ancient civilizations, you invariably come across a pantheon of gods, or to give them their proper description, technologically advanced physical beings who came from the sky. And then there are those gods that came from the sea of creation, from consciousness, or what we might call God with a capital G. Different myths from different key ancient Egyptian cities each attributed the creation to different gods. In Hermopolis, the inherent qualities of the primeval water were represented by the set of eight primordial deities called the Ogjod, and focused on the nature of the universe before the creation of the world. Whereas in Heliopolis, it was the self-engendered god Atum, an inert potential being who was the source of all the elements and forces in the world. His offspring Shu and his sister Tefnut represented the emergence of an empty space amid the waters. Atum is said to have sneezed and spat to produce Shu and Tefnut. Next, Shu and Tefnut coupled to produce the earth god Geb and the sky goddess Nut, who defined the limits of the world. Next, Geb and Nut gave rise to their four children, Osiris, Isis, Set and Nephthys. The myth thus represented the physical reproductive process by which life was made possible. These nine gods were grouped together theologically as the Inead, but the eight lesser gods and all other things in the world were ultimately seen as an extension of Atum. This is clearly one of those examples of blurring the lines, because spitting and sneezing creation is clearly a reference to the creation of the Inead through ejaculation and sexual reproduction. The next version of creation from Memphis centered on the contemplative deity Ptah, who represented the craftsman's ability to envision a finished product and shape raw materials to create that product. The Memphite theology said that unlike the other Egyptian creations, Ptah's work was not physical, rather it was an intellectual creation by the word and mind of God with the ideas developed within Ptah's heart, given form when he named them with his tongue. By speaking these names, Ptah produced the gods and all other things. This Memphite creation myth actually coexisted with the one in Heliopolis, as it was Ptah's creative thought and speech that were believed to have caused the formation of Atum and the Ennead. In Thebes, the theology claimed that the mysterious transcendent god Amun was not merely a member of the Ogdod, but the hidden force behind all things. Separate from the world, his true nature concealed even from the other gods. Because all the gods, including the other creators, were in fact merely aspects of Amun, Amun eventually became the supreme god of the Egyptian pantheon because of the belief he was the ultimate source of creation. It is worth noting that it is from the god Amun that we get the term Amen, a reference to the acknowledgement of the god. So those Christians who pray to God are in fact praying to the Theban deity Amun. And we shall get much deeper into that when we travel further down the Nile and we explore Thebes or modern-day Luxor. 
While these different cosmogonies competed to some extent, in other ways they were complementary, as they all held that the world had arisen out of the lifeless waters of chaos called Nu. They also included a pyramid-shaped mound called the Benben, which was the first thing to emerge from the waters. The lifeless waters of chaos could well be described as the quantum pea soup of probabilities, referred to by quantum physicists, or what some spiritualists might refer to as the void from which all that is originates. As for the Benben, a pyramid-shaped mound, it is possibly some reference to the quantum structure of methane, CH4, an odourless, colourless, flammable gas used primarily as fuel to make heat and light. But more importantly, it is also used to manufacture organic chemicals and life. But let us not digress. At least not yet. The myth of creation was also closely associated with the sun, and the sun was said to have first directly risen from the mound as the general sun god Ra, or as the god Kepri, or from a lotus flower that grew from the mound in the form of a heron, falcon, scarab, beetle or human child. Another common element of the Egyptian cosmogonies is the familiar figure of the cosmic egg, a substitute for the primeval waters or the primeval mound. One variant of the cosmic egg version teaches that the sun god, as primeval power, emerged from the primeval mound, which itself stood in the chaos of the primeval sea. But in speaking of Nu, of the lifeless waters of chaos, and the primeval mound that emerged from it, or the cosmic egg, we are not so much speaking of life on Earth, rather we are speaking about the ancient Egyptian description of the creation of the universe. Amun, Ptah and Atum, as well as the Ogdoad, were simply all names for God, with a capital G, whereas the Ennead were the physical gods, with a small g, who came to Earth tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago. So the things that are of direct interest to us now are not necessarily God with a capital G and the creation of the universe. If we go down that path, it's going to take us in a completely different direction. Another direction that I'd prefer to leave for another time, another book, another set of documentaries. What I'd really like to focus on now is what happened in ancient Egypt and when it happened. Included in the creation myths of the ancient Egyptians are references to a pattern of creation and destruction, repeating in the cycles of time about a beginning and an end for Earth giving rise to something greater. Now that's what we're looking for, cycles of creation and destruction. Something regular that destroys not only temples, but even life on Earth. We know the Earth was hit by a number of asteroids that wiped out the dinosaurs and other life forms throughout the Earth's history. So is it possible that there is some recurring event or series of events that affects the Earth? Some form of asteroid shower? If that is the case, then why is it so regular? And what's the period of that regularity? If it's not an asteroid shower, what is the cause? In 1984, the esteemed and distinguished American physicist and professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Richard A. Muller, caused international controversy with his theory that a killer star, a brown dwarf star christened Nemesis, was and is orbiting our sun and causing cataclysmic comet swarms that bombard the Earth every 26 million years. Initially greeted with disbelief and derision, the Nemesis hypothesis has nonetheless withstood attempts to debunk it and has provided valid explanations for a variety of phenomena, including the dramatic disappearance of the Earth's dinosaur population 65 million years ago. But was Muller right? And if he is, could that explain the demise of ancient Egypt? Well, yes and no. But let's look at that in a later episode. 
For now, let's focus on the ancient Egyptian gods with a little g. That is, the ones who came from the skies on flying boats. And to do that, we need to examine the studies and works of Zechariah Sitchin. To some, a brilliant scholar. To others, a pseudo-scientist, pseudo-historian with delusional thinking. According to Zechariah Sitchin, an alien race of beings called the Anunnaki, literally translated as those who from heaven came, arrived on earth hundreds of thousands of years ago and ruled over the ancient land of Sumer, over 1,500 kilometers east of Egypt in modern-day Iraq. The Sumerian king list, part of the cuneiform Sumerian tablets, discovered and translated by Zechariah Sitchin, likewise refers to ancient kings who ruled pre-dynastic Sumer before a great flood. It reads, after the kinship descended from heaven, the kinship was in Eridag. Alulim became king. He ruled for eight Tsars. Now, according to Sitchin, one Tsar is the unit of time that it takes the Anunnaki home planet, Nibiru, to complete an orbit of our sun. Each Tsar being 3,600 of our years, that makes a total of 20 8,800 years Alulim ruled on Earth. Others, like Enmenluana, ruled for 12 Sars, or 43,000 years. In all, eight rulers reigned in Suma for a total of 241,200 years, before a great flood swept over the land. If the translations are correctly interpreted, and there is no reason to believe they are not, then the years seem implausibly long. But consider this. If a dog lives 10 years, and that is equivalent to 100 of our years, so to the dog, we live 10 dog lifetimes, or 1,000 dog years. To a guinea pig that lives 4 years, we live 2,500 guinea pig years. To a common house mouse that lives one year, we live 10,000 mouse years. And to a common house fly that lives one month, we live 120,000 fly years. To the Anunnaki or Sumerian kings, 10 of their years are 36,000 of our years. It's all relative. In any case, the Sumerian kings ruled for over 240,000 years before the Great Flood. And the ancient Egyptians arrived, or rather returned, after the Great Flood, around 34,000 BC. So, is it possible that they were the same race? After all, the ancient Egyptians returned, meaning they had to have been here before the Great Flood. And what caused the Great Flood? Did they know it was coming and leave the Earth to avoid the cataclysm? How did they know? And are these events connected? It was supposedly the god Thoth who, when the Earth shook, allegedly left Atlantis in a spaceship just prior to the destruction of Atlantis when all was lost in the ocean. So was Thoth one of the physical Anunnaki beings who originally came from the skies to rule on Earth? If so, why did they come? Why did they go? Where are they now? And do they plan to come back? And by saying the Earth shook, are we not just referring to an isolated earthquake or two? That wouldn't make you leave the whole planet. We are talking about global quakes that affected the whole Earth. What could cause such crustal displacements on such a massive scale? And how did Thoth know not only what was going to happen, but when it was time to leave? And by Atlantis, I don't think we're talking about an isolated island. I think for Thoth to leave the planet, we are talking about the destruction of a global civilization. Atlantis, Lemuria, everything. 
Some believe that prior to the fall of Atlantis, knowing a great catastrophe was imminent and unavoidable, those souls left behind moved underground and created subterranean cities, in some cases where the secret knowledge was hidden in crystals and higher frequency elements to be released at a later time. Now we do know about the underground city at Cappadocia in Turkey. A sprawling network of over 200 underground cities, with around 40 of these going to at least three levels deep. They were discovered beneath a Byzantine-era fortress in Derinkuyu, in the area between Kayseri and Nevsia in Turkey. So we know they exist. And these ones are potentially up to 110,000 years old. And surely there must be others. There are those who say that Thoth buried the truth about the creation in a hall of records, the halls of Amenti, in a crystal tablet, which lies beneath the ground in his spaceship near the Great Pyramid. And we will definitely get into that in a much later episode when we examine the Giza Plateau. So clearly there was a great flood, most likely around 34,000 BC. But what caused it? And what happened after it? It is said that after the cataclysm, those who survived the great flood waited for the seas to settle and the sun to come out upon the glistening water below. And when the sun did shine, it rose in the age of Leo, and a new creation began, symbolized by the Sphinx who sits beside the Great Pyramid. The age of Leo is one of 12 astrological ages that correspond to the 12 zodiac signs in Western astrology. But even astrologers don't agree to the exact beginnings and endings of each astrological age, with dates varying up to hundreds of years. So how can we know the exact dates? It was at that time, in the age of Leo, that Thoth returned and brought with him those who would walk upon the land. But when in the age of Leo? Even on average, an age lasts 2,160 years. Okay, so we've got lots of questions. Was the Sphinx there before the 10,500 BC Cataclysm? Which is what the story implies. And if so, why? Or was it a later edition, around the time of Khufu, around 2,490 BC? which is what the Egyptologists would have us believe. And if this is when Thoth returned, after the Great Flood, and he returned to Egypt, then it had to have been around 34,000 BC. So do the pieces add up? And can we trace these beings back to those times, to the Zep Tepi, which wasn't really the first time because they'd been here before. They were returning. So the first time for what? And is there any evidence that we can rely on? The Greek historian Herodotus recorded this claim by priests of Heliopolis. During this time, there were four occasions when the sun rose out of this wanted place, twice rising where he set now and twice setting where he now rises a claim which is echoed by the Roman scholar Pomponius Mela. The Egyptians pride themselves of being the most ancient people in the world. In their authentic annals, one may read that since they have been in existence, the course of the stars has changed directions four times, and that the sun has set twice in the part of the sky where it rises today. Graham Hancock points out that these two peculiar claims can only refer to what is known as the precession of the equinoxes, the wobbling of the Earth around its axis of rotation. Or can they? Perhaps they refer to something far more world-shaking. Let's keep exploring. One of the most important theories on ancient Egypt of the past 20 years in scientific as well as historical terms was proposed by Robert Beval and is known today as the theory of Orion's correlation. According to Beval, the major pyramids of Giza are the projection on land of the three largest stars that form the belt of the constellation of Orion. 
Particularly, Boval suggested that in the age of Leo, a perfect alignment between the former and the latter occurred and could be observed in the Egyptian sky in the year 10,450 BC. But it isn't as perfect as Boval claims. The constellation of Orion is acknowledged as the most significant constellation to the ancient Egyptians and, in 10,450 BC, it was at its lowest position in the southern sky. At the dawn of the vernal equinox, the constellation of Leo was right on the ecliptic while the constellation of Orion was on the meridian. However, the star Mintaka lay on the meridian while the star Alnitak, the correspondent of the Great Pyramid, the most important monument of Giza, was not on the meridian, rather it had moved towards the southeast. And the Pyramid of Menkawa, the smaller pyramid of the three at Giza, was the one on the meridian. Further, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, representing Sothis or Soptet, its ancient Egyptian personification as a goddess, is not visible sitting below the horizon. Despite this slight misalignment, Boval believes that the position of the Sphinx is such that in 10,500 BC, give or take a few hundred years, it was a remarkable astronomical arrangement of the Sun, Orion and the constellation of Leo. And he may be right. The alignment of the stars may even indicate when the pyramids of the Giza Plateau were actually built. And it would mean the Sphinx is at least 12,500 years old. But that alignment would hardly be the cause for a great flood. There must be more to it. The last time that area of Giza in Egypt was prone to heavy rain-type weather was around 10,000 BC. Which may account for the weathering and water damage to the Sphinx, which we shall get right into in a later episode but it doesn't necessarily give any indication as to when the Sphinx was built or why it was built. Interestingly enough, the period that Plato mentions for the cataclysmic and sudden destruction of the fabled Atlantis is approximately 9500 BC. So there may well have been some major geological upheavals around then. Or maybe Plato was wrong. In either case, this was not the specific Great Flood referred to by the ancient Egyptians, nor the ancient Sumerians. There must have been two Great Floods, at least, maybe even more. And we will examine that in much greater detail later in the series. For now, we have to see if we can find more evidence, specifically as it relates to the age of Leo. The length of one of the complete cycles of the Twelve Ages, called the Precession of the Equinoxes, is agreed as around 25,772 years, and advocates believe that when one cycle of the Twelve Astrological Ages is complete, logically another cycle of Twelve Ages begins. So there were two Ages of Leo. One, 25,772 years before the one in 10,000 BC, which would make it, yep, around 35,772 BC, which is smack bang in the middle of our date range of 37,000 to 34,000 BC. I think Baval was definitely on the right track, just the wrong train. And his alignment wasn't actually as perfect as he suggested for good reason. He needed to look back another 25,772 years to the previous age of Leo to see if that alignment was a much better match. And that's just what someone else did. In 2005, Italian researcher Armando May conducted research on the Giza Plateau and together with Nico Moretto, they developed an astronomical correlation analysis through the application of a mathematical model for the pyramids of Giza that culminated in the formulation of the theory of the historical dating of Zeptepi presented at the International Conference on Sciences of Antiquity held at the Zayed University in Dubai. 
According to May and Moretto, the ancient Egyptian civilization originated in the year 36,420 BC. Which provides historical support to the descriptions of the Zip Tepe in the Turin Papyrus. In contrast to Boval's alignment at the dawn of the vernal equinox in the year 36,420 BC, the configuration of the constellations in the sky above Giza are perfectly aligned with all the monuments on the Giza Plateau. Most importantly, it's a perfect connection between Alnitak, the largest star of the belt of Orion, and the Great Pyramid, the biggest monument on the Giza Plateau, with the star Sirius also visible in the sky above Giza. Yes, there was a great flood in the age of Leo, just not the one in 10,000 BC. Although there may have been one then as well, but specifically the one when the gods returned and started the Zeptepi was around 35,000 BC, when Thoth and the Anunnaki supposedly returned to Earth after the great flood. A coincidence? I think not. The question is, what caused it? And why was it called the first time? I'll get to that and lots more in a later episode. For now, we need to focus on what happened with the humans. The Mousterian Pluvial, sometime between 50,000 and 30,000 BC, caused the Sahara to bloom like never before, not only in vegetation and wildlife, but also in new human settlements, with early humans, still Neanderthals, spread to almost every habitable area of North Africa. And, dare I say it, the Denisovans. Hunter-gatherers' societies continued in the region throughout the periods now designated as the Artarian culture from 145,000 to 20,000 BC, during which stone tools were manufactured with greater skill, and the Kormusan industry from 42,000 to 18,000 BC, where tools and arrowheads were developed not only from stone, but also from animal bone and hematite. The Hafen culture then flourished around 30,000 to 15,000 BC in the region between Egypt and Nubia, eventually giving way to the Kadan and the Sibelian cultures, also known as the Komombo or Esna cultures, around 13,000 to 10,000 BC. Sibelian tools manufactured from diorite and hard black igneous rock that was plentiful in this area. There was also a silsilan industry around 13,000 BC, a highly developed microblade industry that included truncated blades and blades of unusual shapes made specifically for one task, including a wide variety of bladelets for mounting onto spears, darts and arrows. Some cases are thousands of years ahead of anything found in Europe from this period. Let's keep exploring. Continued expansion of the desert during the Neolithic period forced all these hunter-gatherer societies to settle around the Nile more permanently and eventually adopt a more sedentary lifestyle, ultimately settling into more permanent communities centered around agriculture. Often referred to as the Epipaleolithic period from 10,000 to 5,500 BC, this transition from the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer to Neolithic sedentary farming is one of the most intriguing mysteries of prehistoric Egypt. We actually know very little about how or why this change actually happened. But that doesn't stop the so-called experts from speculating and speaking about it as if it was fact. So who knows what the real truth is? Maybe the desert didn't expand. Maybe it suddenly appeared. And I'll get to that in a later episode. Perhaps nowhere is evidence of this cultural transition more accessible than in the area known as the Fayum Oasis, a natural basin southwest of the Giza Plateau, which gave rise to the culture then in the area known as Fayum A, around 9000 to 6000 BC. Now, if the Fayum A civilization started sometime, say, around 8355 BC, which is plausible, and went for 1,255 years until around 7,000 BC, 
then it would align with the return to Earth of the followers of Horus, the dynastic lineage of semi-divine beings or demigods mentioned in the Papyrus of Turin, who arrived sometime around 8,355 BC, ruling Egypt's pre-dynastic period for 1,255 years. Was it their return, along with their technical knowledge, that put an end to the Stone Age? Or do we actually have two parallel races, two parallel civilizations, like the ruling class and the peasants, the Western scientists and the primate Amazonian tribes? And is there more evidence of the influence of the followers of Horus elsewhere on the planet? Perhaps there is. Although it's one of the world's most prestigious megalithic monuments, the prehistoric stone circle known as Stonehenge, built on the rolling hills of Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, about three kilometres west of Amesbury, England, remains shrouded in mystery. In fact, the sheer scale of activity within this region of England during the Neolithic period is staggering, with numerous and varied structures being created in several stages, mainly between 3000 and 1500 BC, and used concurrently over hundreds of years and many generations for ceremonies, burials, trade and astrological predictions. Far too much for us to examine here, but there are key aspects of Stonehenge that may be relative to Egypt. So let's have a quick look. Stonehenge, as it currently stands, consists of an enclosure of 90 meters in diameter, approached by an avenue and containing a complex arrangement of ritual pits, abandoned stone holes and circles made from blue stone and sarsen stones called trilithons, measuring up to 7.3 meters in height, 2.1 meters wide and weighing around 25 tons. But it didn't start that way. The earliest structures known in the immediate area date to the Mesolithic period between 8500 and 7000 BC and are four or five large Mesolithic post holes or pits around two and a half feet in diameter set in an east-west alignment, three of which appear to have held large pine totem pole-like posts which may have had ritual significance. Now here is where the archaeologists cross the line of credibility. These pits are about two and a half feet in diameter, which is quite substantial, but there is absolutely no evidence of totem-like poles, just rotten wood. So it's pure speculation, and it's not even known how or if these posts relate to the later monuments of Stonehenge, if at all. So the lesson is that we best stick to the evidence, like that uncovered in Egypt. In fact, just south of Egypt, at Napta. Located in southern Egypt, approximately 800 kilometers south of modern-day Cairo and about 100 kilometers west of Abu Simbel and dating to around 7500 BC is Nabda Playa, once a large internally drained basin in the Nubian desert and one of the earliest archaeological sites of the Egyptian Neolithic period. Was it also part of an original branch of the Nile, as we discussed in the last episode? It's possible, and recent archaeological discoveries in the region indicate that human occupation in this area may date back to at least 10,000 BC. Was this when the catastrophe happened? The population of Nabda Playa had large and organized villages with pre-planned above-ground huts arranged in straight rows and below-ground stone constructions including deep wells for sources of water held throughout the year. The population consumed goats, sheep and fish, fruit and legumes, millet, wild sorghum and tubers, and used ceramics adorned by complicated painted patterns created perhaps by using combs made from fishbone. But that's not what's so interesting about them. 
It is suggested the inhabitants of Nabda Playa may have had more advanced knowledge of the astronomy and mathematics than previously thought possible, and as such, fashioned the world's earliest known archaeoastronomical devices, including an alignment of large megalithic stones that may have indicated the rising of Sirius around 6088 BC and other alignments dating to 6270 BC. Large megalithic stones. Does that sound familiar? They also constructed a calendar circle that some believe represents the approximate direction of the summer solstice sunrise, although the spaces between the pairs of stones in the gates are a bit too wide and the distances between the gates are too short for accurate calendar measurements, whilst others suggest the stones in the circle indicate alignments to Arcturus Alpha Centauri and the belt of Orion, also dating to 6270 BC, which matches the radiocarbon dating of campfires around the circle. I know where my money is on that, with the evidence, and 6270 BC. Although Alpha Centauri is primarily only visible in the Southern Hemisphere. So what does that tell us? There are also suggestions the circle was a representation of the Milky Way as it was in 17,500 BC and maps of Orion at 16,500 BC. But these suggestions have been criticized by some, saying these extremely early dates, as well as the proposition that the nomads had contact with extraterrestrial life, are inconsistent with the archaeological records. Well... What if the archaeological record is wrong? I think we better go back to Fayon to examine more evidence. The inhabitants of Fayum A occupied the area around a large lake, which was fresh water in prehistory, but today is a saltwater lake, and relied on agriculture, hunting and fishing for their living. It makes sense that if you were to return to the earth, you would base yourself very near to a source of fresh water, such as a river, or a lake, or both. But what happened to turn the lake from fresh water to salt water? Was it something to do with another great flood, or the rapid expansion of the desert, or some other geological upheaval? We shall have to wait and see. The Fayum A population build reed huts with underground cellars for storage of grains. Cattle, sheep and goats were domesticated and baskets and pottery making were developed. Centralized forms of tribal government began at this period with tribal chieftains assuming positions of power that may have been passed on to the next generation in a family or tribal unit. That's quite a step up from simple hunter-gatherers. In fact, it's a quantum leap. So, was it a choice? Or was it a change forced upon them due to a sudden shortage of prey caused by the expanding desert? And is it possible the sequence of tribal chieftains led towards a succession of kings? Because that's where it all seems to be taking us. Taking us towards the period known as the pre-dynastic era of ancient Egypt. The pre-dynastic period is generally recognized as spanning the era from around 6000 to 3150 BC, whilst there are no written records from this period in charting the history of ancient Egypt. Scholars rely on both archaeological evidence and ancient works such as the Egyptiaca, the history of Egypt, an Egyptian dynastic chronology written by a Greek priest called Manetho in the 3rd century BC. In essence, Egyptiaca is a chronology of events arranged from the oldest to the most recent according to the reign of a particular king. Unfortunately, Manetho's original script has been lost, and the only record of his chronology is that contained in the works of later historians such as Flavius Josephus in the 1st century AD. 
This has led to some controversy over how accurate Manetho's chronology is, but even so, it is routinely consulted by scholars, archaeologists and historians, and compared to the artifacts and evidence unearthed at archaeological excavations throughout Egypt in charting the history and development of civilizations in the Nile River Valley during ancient Egypt. The periods of the pre-dynastic period are thus named for the regions or ancient city sites in which these artifacts were found, not necessarily the names of the cultures that actually lived in those areas. And it should be noted that these historical periods did not seamlessly or sequentially follow on from one another. There was overlapping. Many of these cultures overlapped, and according to some interpretations, different cultures in the pre-dynastic period can also be seen as simply developments of a single culture. So basically, it's a dog's breakfast. It's all over the place. It's all guesswork. Educated guessworks? Yes, but still guesswork. It's here, between 7000 BC and the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt in 3100 BC, that we find the reigns of all those non-mortal kings. First, a lineage of 80 kings that held sway for 1817 years. Then 30 Memphite kings, who reigned for 1790 years followed by 10 Thinite kings, who ruled for 350 years. A total of 120 kings who ruled Egypt for just under 4,000 years. But again, who or what were these Memphite and Thinite kings? If they weren't mortal humans, what were they? Neanderthals? Denisovans? Hybrid offspring of the gods and humans? Or were they the source of the missing, unidentified DNA found in the Denisovans? As they say, the plot thickens. The Fayum A culture, in turn, gave rise to the Marimda culture, sometime between 5000 and 4000 BC. Or maybe it was a little earlier, say 5200 BC. And this is when the Memphite kings took the throne. The reed huts of the Fayum A period gave way to pole-framed huts with wind breaks, along with semi-subterranean residences, with walls built high enough to stand above ground, the homes laid out in rows or in circular patterns. These developments were improved upon around 4000 BC by the El Omari culture, known from a small settlement near modern Cairo, who built oval huts of greater sophistication with walls of plastered mud. Unfortunately, only post holes and pits survive. Just like at Stonehenge. But is there a connection? I guess we'll have to wait and see. The Alomari culture developed stone blade tools, including small flakes, axes and sickles, woven mats for floors and walls, and more sophisticated ceramics. Could the Alomari culture have started slightly later? say around 3600 BC, and being the civilization ruled by the Thinite kings. Surely it's possible. Around the same time as the El Omari culture, there developed two other cultures, the Ma'adi culture, best known for the site near Cairo, and the Tazian culture, named for the burials found at Der Tassa on the east bank of the Nile between Asyut and Akmim. They were characterized by further developments in pottery and technology. Copper, which is not mined in Egypt, rather imported from the Sinai, or possibly Nubia, was now known to make copper adzes. However, their greatest advance was in the area of architecture, as they constructed large community buildings containing underground chambers, stairs and hearths. Is that like Cappadocia in Turkey? And why underground? We'll explore all of that in a later episode. All of these cultures grew and flourished in the region known as Lower Egypt, that is Northern Egypt, closest to the Mediterranean Sea, while civilization in Upper Egypt developed later, starting with a Badarian culture around 4500 to 4000 BC. The Badarian culture is named for the Badari site near Der Tessa and provides the earliest direct evidence of agriculture in Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic era. Its people were farmers who grew wheat, barley, lentils and herbs and supplemented their largely vegetarian diet through fishing and hunting. 
They also had domesticated animals providing food and clothing, as well as materials for tents. Perhaps the Badarian culture fostered the Memphite kings, although geographically that doesn't make as much sense as the Marimda culture. But it should at least be considered. The Badari culture was primarily known from cemeteries discovered in the low desert. About 600 graves have been located, with a burying of the more prosperous members of the community in a different part of the cemetery. The deceased were placed on mats and buried in pits with their heads usually laid to the south, looking west. The graves contained a large number of grave goods, including weapons such as knives, axes, throwing sticks, bifacial sickles and concave-based arrowheads, along with tools such as end scrapers and perforators. During this period, food offerings and personal belongings were also buried with the dead, indicating a shift in the burial practices, where now the dead were thought to need material goods in their journey to the afterlife. Remains of cattle, dogs and sheep were also found in the cemeteries. Were they domestic pets or sources of food? Maybe they were both. Following the Badarian period around 4000 to 3500 BC came the Amratian culture, also known as the Nakada One period, during which more sophisticated dwellings with hearths, walls of wattle and dope, and windbreaks outside the main doorway were created. They may even have had windows. Ceramics were highly developed, as were other artistic pursuits such as sculpting. It was around this time, 3500 BC, that the practice of mummification began, with grave goods continuing to be left with the deceased. That would be around the same time as the beginning of the Thinite kings, and some other rather interesting developments. From 3500 to 3200 BC, the Gersian culture, named after the site of Gerse, but also known as Nagada II, initiated trade with other regions that accelerated trade and inspired advances in the artistic skills of the people and their art. Houses were made of sun-baked brick, and the more expensive dwellings featured courtyards, an addition that would later become commonplace in Egyptian homes. Flint blades were sophisticated and beads and amulets were made out of metals and lapis lazuli. Copper was evident in weapons and in jewellery, and the people of this period used gold foil and silver. Gold, which has one of the highest melting points of any metal, over 1000 degrees Celsius. But more on that in a later episode. It was this Gersian culture that introduced the images and totems of the falcon, symbol of the sun god Ra, the cow, symbol of the love goddess Hathor, and laid the foundations for the dynastic Egypt that soon followed. If not during the Elomari culture, then perhaps Nakata II is where and when the ten Thinite kings ruled. It is certainly closer to Abydos and the king's list in the temple of Seti I. Let's keep exploring. In approximately 3500 BC, as the first farmers, the Windmill Hill people, one of the first semi-nomadic hunting and gathering groups with an agricultural economy, began to clear the trees and develop the area. They built a complex, including a causewayed enclosure at Robin Hood's Ball, two cursors monuments, Neolithic earthwork enclosures comprising parallel banks, one a ditch hewn in the chalk six feet deep and wide, 700 meters north of the Stonehenge site on an east-west alignment that was nearly one and a half miles long and 150 yards wide, along with several large furrows and mounds. Some archaeologists have suggested this was used for chariot racing by the ancient Britons, or as a processional way, a path for the dead. Are they serious? A six-foot deep racetrack? I'll tell you my learned observations. They were hunter-gatherers. This was a ditch to trap animals, most likely deer. You surround the forest and corral the deer towards the awaiting trap. Rocket science? I think not. But is there more evidence to support that? Well, yes there is. 
around 2700 BC, using only pigs made of deer antlers, a hinge made of late Cretaceous seaford chalk was constructed. The deer antlers are a big clue. A circular banked earthwork enclosure measuring about 110 meters in diameter with an internal ditch of six feet deep was dug in sections with a chalk dug from the ditch piled up to make the bank on the inside. So now, rather than a long ditch, we have a large circular trap with the hunters able to stand up on the ditches in easy, safe vantage points to fire arrows into the prey and to spear the prey. To the northeast of the henge, a large entrance was created by a gap in the ditch and bank. No doubt to steer the wild oxen and deer into the trap. With a smaller entrance to the south. Perhaps for the humans to use as an exit and entrance. The builders placed the bones of deer and oxen in the bottom of the ditch. Possibly superstitious rituals to bring good fortune to the hunters. Around five meters inside the monument's bank, an accurate 271.6 meters circumference circle of 56 evenly distributed pits, known as the Aubrey Holes, an average of 0.76 meters deep and 1.06 meters in diameter, were dug. The pits may have contained standing timbers, creating a timber circle, although there is no excavated evidence of them. And if these pits were primed with sharpened poles, then they would be the perfect traps. So what about the stones? Why were they added? Let's leave that for a little later and focus our attention back in Egypt on the next development on the Gerzian culture. As yet undiscovered, the southern city of Thinis was the capital city of the first dynasties of ancient Egypt and well attested to by ancient writers, including Munitho, who cites it as the center of the Thinite Confederacy, a tribal confederation whose leader, Menes, or Nama, united Egypt and was its first pharaoh. That would seem to support the position that the Thinite kings ruled Nakata I. But why is Thinus as yet undiscovered? Where is it? Or where was it? Surely such a major city would at least have ruins. Are they buried somewhere under the sands of Egypt awaiting discovery? If so, how did they get there? More on that when we get further down the Nile to Abydos. Just north of Nakara, the city of Abydos became an important burial site, eventually growing into a necropolis. Large tombs were constructed, originally using mud brick, one tomb comprising 12 rooms, and over time the graves became more ornate, with wood used in the graves of the more affluent and niches carved into the sides for votive offerings. We shall examine all of this in much greater detail in a later episode when we travel down the Nile to Abydos. It was also in Abydos, around 3400 to 3200 BC, that hieroglyphic scripts developed, the earliest Egyptian writings discovered on ceramics, clay seal impressions, and bone and ivory pieces used for keeping records during this time. Now to this point, society has supposedly existed for over seven and a half thousand years without writing. Why? Why was there no need for writing before 3200 BC? More importantly, why did it develop? I'll get to that in a later episode. Nakata II led to the Nakata Third Period, 3200 to 3100 BC, sometimes referred to as the Dynasty Zero or the Proto-Dynastic Period. 
However, there's a problem with calling this period a dynasty as such, because Egyptian dynasties attempt to group together either a family of rulers or at least those who ruled from a specific place and the Nakata Third Period takes none of this into account. Rather, it attempts to take in rulers in different locations ruling different territories. Nevertheless, the term Dynasty Zero has come into general use and is unlikely to be discarded. Nakata III, by being in contact with Mesopotamia through trade, shows significant Mesopotamian influences that brought new ideas and values to Egypt. Soon, small communities of brick homes and buildings grew into larger urban centers. The three major city-states of Upper Egypt at this time being Thinis, Nakada, and Nekan. There were 13 or so rulers at Nekan, of which only the last few have been identified, though they are by no means certain. Horus, Crocodile, Horus Hat Hor, Horus Iri Hor, Horus Ka, Horus Scorpion, and Horus Nama, Baleful Catfish. These rulers also wore the white crown of Upper Egypt and were depicted as superhuman figures, giants who towered above mortal men. Or maybe they were giants and they did tower above mortal men. More on the giants later. These competing cities subsequently attacked each other. Thinus seems to have conquered Nakada and then absorbed Nekan. The conflicts fought by the Scorpion Kings, Scorpion I, Scorpion II, and Ka, also known as Siken, which is a title, not a name. The conflicts most likely over trade goods and water supplies, Scorpion I, Scorpion II, and Ka being the last three kings of the proto-dynastic period. A Thinite king, Nama, conquered and unified Lower Egypt with Upper Egypt and established the First Dynasty and married Princess Nathotep of Nakata in an alliance designed to strengthen ties between the two cities. However, the issue of who actually unified Upper and Lower Egypt raises some confusion. It also raises more questions. According to Egyptica, the 3rd century BC chronology of ancient Egypt by Manetho, the first king of Egypt was not Nama, it was Manus, a king of Upper Egypt, possibly from the city of Thinis or Hyrcanopolis, who overcame the other city-states around him and then went on to conquer Lower Egypt around 3150 BC. And that's where the problem arises, because apart from the name Menes, being found on an ivory inscription from Nakada associated with Hor Aha, there is no archaeological evidence anywhere to corroborate the actual existence of Menes. And there's good reason for that. The name Menes in Greek is actually a title meaning he who endures. And since Menetho was Greek, it's more than likely that Menes is not a personal name it's a title. Nama was a Thinite king from Upper Egypt, from the city of Thinus, and he has been confirmed as an actual Egyptian ruler through the discovery of a year marker bearing his name, his tomb, and the Nama palette on which he is depicted as a military leader conquering his enemies and subjugating a region that is clearly Lower Egypt. But was Nama an actual finite king? Was he a non-mortal? Or was he the first mortal king to rule Egypt? Perhaps we will find some answers on the Nama palette. more than likely quarried from Wadi Hamamat, east of Luxor, and named after Horus Nama, the baleful catfish, whose title appears on both its faces, as Namea in hieroglyphs, the Nama palette is possibly the earliest example of hieroglyphic inscriptions, making it one of the most important artifacts from the dawn of Egyptian civilization, and so valuable that it has never been permitted to leave Egypt. And for that reason alone, we need to have a very close look at it. 
The Nama palette was originally discovered along with hundreds of objects, including a number of large relief-covered ceremonial mace heads, ivory statuettes, carved knife handles, figurines of scorpions and other animals, stone vessels and a second elaborately decorated palette, known as the Two Dogs palette, now in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford all dedicated to Horus as part of a main deposit unearthed in the temple at Necken in Hierakompolis. However, most of these items were not for everyday use, as they were more than twice the size of normal items. Or were they for everyday use? Just for the use of a giant twice the size of a mortal man? Used as a ceremonial plate, the beautifully carved triangular shield-shaped piece of black basalt is a little over two feet high and made of smooth greyish-green siltstone or schist. It is decorated on both faces with detailed low reliefs, showing a series of ambiguous scenes that have been difficult to interpret and have resulted in a number of theories regarding their meaning, with a satisfactory interpretation of the scene still elusive. The top of each side of the palette is decorated in a similar manner. The name of the king, Baleful Catfish, inscribed in a so-called serek, or early form of cartouche, as a catfish and a chisel. The Baleful Catfish. Not really a cool tag by today's standards. Although it might have some merit as the catchy name of a New Orleans soul food restaurant, but it must have had some considerable significance 5,000 years ago. Each serek is framed by two thrones or palaces, an indication Nama now presides over both kingdoms, and is set between two bovine heads that represent the sky goddess Bat, an early representation of Hathor. Are the two bulls on either side really representations of the god Hathor? If so, why are they on the palette in such prominent positions. Wouldn't it be more likely that the bulls simply represent that with Nama we are in the age of the bull, the age of Taurus, which began around 4300 BC and it ended a thousand years later around 2150 BC, and that the bull is a symbol of power, the new king's power? Or did they have some other as yet unknown significance. Beneath the headers, one side of the palette is dominated by the image of a bearded Nama wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt, a kilt with the images of bull's heads on it, a bull's tail attached to the rear. He is holding a mace with which he is about to crush the head of a northern foe. The image of the white crown always has me wondering if the reason why the crown was that shape is because the head was shaped that way, an elongated skull. Did Nama and all of the other non-mortal finite kings have elongated skulls? This image of the mighty and victorious pharaoh smiting his enemies became the standard way to represent and promote the pharaoh throughout the entire 3000 year dynastic period of ancient Egypt. This is basically the same image that we have seen emblazoned over all the walls and pylons of all the temples we have examined so far, in particular on the inner and entrance walls at Abu Simbel and at Bayat al-Wali at Kalabsha, both associated with Ramses II, on the relocated stella associated with Seti I on Kalabsha, and on both sides of both pylons at Philae, associated with various of the Ptolemies. And I dare say we're going to see a lot more of it. Standing behind Nama and at half his height is his sandal bearer, a position of great honour. So special, in fact, it's going to get you a supporting role on the credits on the palette. But either his sandal bearer was a dwarf, and he hasn't been carved to look like a dwarf, or Nama was actually a giant. In front of the king is the falcon god Horus, the upper Egyptian god of Nekem and protector of kings. 
Instead of a claw, Horus has a human arm that holds a rope that binds and restrains by the nose, a personification of the papyrus marsh of the delta of Lower Egypt, represented as six papyrus stalks, which are possibly cities. Certainly Nama would have had to conquer or convert numerous cities in Lower Egypt to achieve his objective. Perhaps that's what this represents, or perhaps it's a body count. 6,000 killed, as a papyrus plant is equivalent to 1,000 in hieroglyphics, meaning six plants equals 6,000 killed. Either way, it certainly makes sense. In addition, a label found in 1998 during excavations in Abydos seemed to confirm the historical validity of the palette. On this label, a catfish strikes down a fallen enemy. The enemy's headgear consists of three papyrus plants, a reference to a marshland to the personified marshland on the Nama palette. It is highly likely that both sources refer to the same event. A battle in a marshland, probably located in the eastern Nile Delta, which resulted in a victory for Nama. Beside the marsh is what is most likely the name of a city and, beneath that, a representative of that city being subjugated. Ah, the art of gentle persuasion. Beneath Nama's feet are two more subjugates, clearly deceased, accompanied by the names of an unknown walled city and another city, indicating both have clearly been breached and conquered by the king. That all seems to follow the historical narrative perfectly. But the other side of the palette puts a whole new spin on things altogether. The reverse side of the palette is divided into three sections, the top section being a procession. Or more correctly, perhaps, a military campaign. The object of this procession is clearly detailed on the right-hand side of the scene. Ten decapitated corpses, nine of which, who have also been castrated, are shown lying lined up on the ground, their heads and genitals positioned between their legs. This is a very specific illustration. It's not just ten dead guys. What was the significance of castrating them? Did it have something to do with breeding? Or stopping breeding? It does seem rather extreme. And was it done before they were decapitated or after? We know that when Osiris was killed and dismembered, Isis basically cloned him from his DNA. But was this some sort of representation about the inferior human race not being permitted to procreate unless it was controlled, perhaps just to breed slaves? Is that too far-fetched? Perhaps not. We'll have to see what else we can uncover. Above the victims is a ship with a harpoon and a falcon on it. These signs are often interpreted as the name of the conquered region. If this name has remained the same throughout the history of ancient Egypt, then the region conquered by Nama was the Mariotis region, the seventh lower Egyptian province. But what if it doesn't mean that, and it didn't mean that at the time? Here is a boat, not in the water, but in the sky. And in it is the god Horus, bearing a weapon, a harpoon. Does this mean Nama was assisted by armed beings from the sky? And the sparrow and the door, what do they mean? The two signs in front of the probable name of the region, the wing of a door and a sparrow, are thought to mean create or found. The entire group could thus be interpreted that on one occasion of the conquest of the Mariotis region, Nama founded a new province, whose name was written by the ship, the harpoon and the falcon. Or does it mean a smaller force coming through some stargate or portal? We don't know, so any plausible proposition has to be considered. Leading the procession are four standard bearers, the first two supporting Horus, the third most likely a cat or a dog, and the final indistinguishable, although some have proposed it is an animal skin. Now these guys actually do look like dwarves, who were considered to be good luck. Or do they belong to another sub-branch of the human family? 
And if these standards are aligned with gods, with beings from the skies, then the fourth one looks like a blob with a tail. Next in line is what is most often referred to as a priest wearing a leopard skin. Yeah, right, a priest with long hair. The priests are usually bald. This is what it appears to be, a naked female carrying what appears to be two drooping papyrus stalks. A blind man at midnight could see that with both his eyes closed. Surely this is Nama's wife, Nithotep, and the drooping stalks represent Nakada and perhaps another city with which Nithotep was affiliated, both of which were conquered by Nama. Then comes King Nama, the catfish and chisel representing his name beside his head. Again, Nama is dressed as before, but on this side he wears the red crown of Lower Egypt. As a representation of his position as king, he is portrayed as two or three times bigger than everyone else, perhaps 12 to 15 feet in height. Seriously? That's what they think? Couldn't it be possible? In fact, wouldn't it be more likely that Nama was actually that tall. Goliath in the Bible was supposedly a giant. So were many of the gods in many of the ancient mythologies, which we shall look at in detail in a later episode. Nama was a Thinite king. So was he a non-mortal, a god, or even a demigod, a direct descendant of the gods from the Zeptepi? Surely it's more than just a possibility. Following Nama, as he did on the opposite side of the pallet, is his sandal bearer. And above and behind the sandal bearer is something that I could not find identified anywhere. Something that conveniently seems to have been overlooked or ignored completely by the Egyptologists. A rectangle with a pyramid inside it. Or more precisely, a pyramid sitting inside a compound. Now, according to all the learned Egyptologists, the first pyramid didn't appear until the third dynasty, the best part of 400 years later. Which means that either the Nama palette doesn't belong to Nama, which given it has his name on it, is highly unlikely, or, and my money is on the latter, it means that there was at least one pyramid around at the beginning of the first dynasty. And where is this compound with the pyramid? Well, we'll get into that later on in the series when we explore Saqqara. But having dropped that bombshell, let's see what else we can discover. Below the procession scene, the central register, which has a Mesopotamian style about it, represents two men, each using a leash to restrain long-necked animals, referred to as serpapods, whose entwined necks form a circle in which makeup was held. What is their significance? Were they long-necked lions? Spotless leopards? Or some sort of hybrid creature left over from the age of the dinosaurs. Were they real or were they imagined? A case of artistic license employed just to create a circular area in the center of the palette? But wouldn't it have made more sense to use two giraffes or better still, two cobras? The tying together of the necks of the two animals has often been interpreted by Egyptologists as a symbol for the tying together of Upper and Lower Egypt. No, I'm not buying into that. There is nothing here that indicates that those animals are symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt, or of which is which. And in fact, the two men are not tying them together, they are restraining them effectively keeping them apart. One thing is certain, the image is as confusing as it is unique. Beneath the serpapods, in the lowest level of the side, is a bull, the symbol of the pharaoh's power, smashing the wall of the city and trampling yet another foe. The palette actually mentions three names of cities or fortresses that were overthrown, which is consistent with the most likely scenario that the supposed unification was more a systematic corporate takeover 
of Lower Egypt. And why not? Lower Egypt had the richest soil and access to the Mediterranean Sea and all the major trade routes. It was the Suez Canal all over again, a precursor. And that's good enough for me. I have no difficulty in identifying the first dynastic king as the Thinite king, Nama, who endured numerous battles and resistance to finally unite Upper and Lower Egypt. The only questions that really remain are, one, was Nama human, or a hybrid, or a god? And two, when he took over Lower Egypt, did he do it through a series of acquisitions, or by military conquest? There is no disagreement concerning the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, but there is some disagreement amongst academics as to whether Nama united Egypt by force or peacefully. Perhaps it was both. Perhaps under the pressure of constant attack, Lower Egypt eventually capitulated and surrendered to the king who endured. In the end, who cares? What's really relevant is not how it happened, but that the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt did happen. What is also relevant is that it's almost certain Nama would have had to use his military might to maintain peace in the newly established kingdom, putting down rebellions, and this would definitely account for his depiction in inscriptions such as the Nama palette. It was publicity and propaganda. It is also claimed that Nama was the last king of the pre-dynastic period, and that Menes was Hor Aha, the first king of the early dynastic period, listed by Manetho as Menes' successor. Well, Nama was the last king of the pre-dynastic period, and that Hor Aha, his successor, was most likely his son, perhaps to a human mother, and therefore the first king actually of the early dynastic period. Having united the two lands of Egypt, Nama established a central government, and the written history of ancient Egypt officially began, a history that would initiate a culture lasting for the next 3,000 years. And that probably explains why the name Menes was on the Nakada ivory inscription associated with Hor Aha. It was simply passed down from father to son. From the evidence, it appears that the gods returned to Earth after some great catastrophe around 35,000 BC that caused a great flood. But the evidence also suggests that they were here hundreds of thousands of years before that, and that they knew of the impending disaster and fled the Earth to avoid the catastrophe. Who were they? What caused them to leave? And why did they return afterwards? And where are they now? Is there another great flood about to happen? And are there clues to that to be found at Stonehenge? Perhaps we'll find more evidence when we start to examine the dynastic period of Egypt in the next episode. Stop, stop.